Hello there. It's obvious that the UK establishment has scant real regard for anyone who has been harmed as a result of this recent health emergency. Have you seen the video of the Tory MP for Christchurch, Sir Christopher Chope, recently asking questions in the House of Commons about the medical intervention? Well, he was speaking to a handful of fellow Tory MPs while the opposition benches were completely devoid of MPs. That's two Tory ministers and the Speaker, who have to be there, and four other Tory MPs. Other than that, tumbleweed. A scandalous state of affairs, given the numbers of people affected by this situation, in some cases a government-enforced situation. And one of the Tory MPs, Andrew Bridgen, has already had the whip removed for asking just about the same sorts of questions. And Chope said that the government was in denial about all of this, in contrast, he said, with the German government that is now beginning to get to grips with the reality of it. Now get with this. As I said in a recent video, the government has been forced to increase the number of people dealing with the fallout from these medical procedures from four people to a team of 80. A 20-fold increase. That tells us that there is more than just a mere handful. It's probably many, many thousand who have been affected. Now, are those politicians who weren't in attendance to listen to what Chope had to say going to try and tell us that none of the people affected are in their constituencies and, if they are, they haven't written to their MPs? that no Labour, Lib Dem or SNP NPs get letters about it. Yeah, pull the other one. For any other issue that affects so many people that the government department dealing with it has to be beefed up by such a degree and modernised to get claims processed, the opposition would be there in their droves all over it, questioning, probing and demanding answers. But they are not. And the first thing that tells you is that Labour will do as much if they get into power to keep the lid on it as the Tory government is doing right now. Labour will not help those who've lost loved ones or been adversely affected themselves. No, they'll just take on the same broom and rug that the Tories already use in order to keep it buried. All aided and abetted by a press that will remain steadfastly silent. No one's been safe throughout this whole episode. They herded people into care homes, then shafted the care workers. They used psychology and duress on us to control us. They targeted parents and their children alike. And now this. Now the claim will be made that if they do start acknowledging any of this, it would bring the science into question. And if that happens, the stupid little people will stop following other medical diktats. I mean, advice. And we can't have that, can we? So best some people suffer in enforced silence rather than have the science questioned. From what I've seen, that's what ministers and the rest of the MPs want to see. People shutting up and even dying for the sake of a belief in the science. Keeping stumm for the greater good. With a real worry for the establishment that if people do successfully question the science over the health emergency, what aspect of the science will they question next? The huge wealth redistribution power play that is net zero, perhaps. And remember, they cannot afford to lose that control grid opportunity, can they? Now, there are three types of people out there where the likes of Net Zero is concerned. The freedom lovers, who want to get on with their lives with minimal interference. Those that want to control every aspect of our lives, either to make themselves feel virtuous or for money or power-based reasons, or worse. 
and those who love to be controlled, those whose lives are not complete unless someone else is laying down the guidelines and rules within which they must exist, and those that love to control or who love to be controlled are desperate to force the freedom lovers into their little corral. We mustn't let them lie, cajole and use force to get their way. So you may be pleased to hear that the European Union has caved into the German car manufacturing lobby and allowed internal combustion engine or ICE cars to be sold after 2035. But only as long as those engines can burn electrofuels or e-fuels. Yes, this might give the ordinary prole a stay of execution allowing them to keep their little diesel or petrol car going for a while longer, but that won't last long. Nothing about net zero that I've seen so far is about helping the ordinary folk. It's all about taking their money and freedoms away from them. So I have this suspicion that this relaxation of the rules is all about allowing the few to maintain their own freedoms to travel and not be totally reliant, as the rest of us will be, on the electricity grid. And the reason I say that is because e-fuels are not efficient. E-fuels are made by mixing carbon captured from the air being mixed with hydrogen formed via electrolysis using renewable electricity from the likes of wind, solar and nuclear. So when e-fuels are burnt, the carbon is re-released back into the environment and the only other byproduct is water. Therefore, they are claimed to be carbon neutral. But an independent Washington-based body, the International Council on Clean Transportation or ICCT, claims that e-fuels are 16% efficient when compared to the 72% efficiency of pure electric vehicles. With a study by Transport and Environment, a Brussels-based NGO claiming that an electric vehicle could go five times further than an e-petrol car using the same amount of renewable electricity. Do you think that could be offered cheap to the likes of you and I? But were you from the rich and powerful elite, would that expense bother you? Would any added cost deter you from zooming about in your e-petrol car while the rest of humanity could only afford to take the bus or bicycle? And while they're soaking up all that electricity to make their e-fuels, the rest of us will have to make do with less. But e-fuels will also have other applications, of course. Backup generators for the wealthy, and also fuel to power the military, and flight for those who are still allowed to travel, one supposes. As I see it, the imposition of environmentally damaging electric vehicles with no infrastructure will rob us of our freedoms but I also suspect the mega-powerful are worried it might affect them too. So what better way to insure against that risk by having another expensive and out-of-reach to the great unwashed mode of transport available to the few in the form of inefficient and expensive e-fuels? Just a thought. Richard. France is burning, but you won't hear much about it in the mainstream media. Because the elephant in the room is Macron being kicked out in these protests and will more than likely mean Marine Le Pen is the next French president. The liberal lefty mainstream media won't like it, blah, blah, blah. Look, that's how you view world events from a left-right paradigm. It's rubbish, isn't it? Did you know that? I could have given you a really convincing argument on that. <laughs> that because that's how you dissect world events uh, based on the, the terms of those that orchestrate them. Do you actually think the French would put up with Macron going all maverick and raising the retirement age all by himself? Of course not. And <laughs> Emmanuel Macron knows this. So why would he do it, knowing that instability would follow? You'd swear it was part of some plan to cause instability. Hmm. But that would result in the EU failing. Hmm. I thought he wanted the EU to succeed. Hmm. Keep thinking, guys. Well, once again, you just have to predict how the blocks will collapse to see where this is going. As in, build back better. 
Oh, what a golden opportunity! Another one, says Klaus. Now, I hate to burst your bubble on this, but the glimmers of hope like the Dutch farmers rise in politics and the uh, French protesters rising up and taking on the establishment in the WEF may be nothing more than mirages of an oasis in democracy in the middle of a desert of propaganda which is taking place all across the earth. So a revolution in France and a collapsing German economy may spell the end of the hated EU, but that is part of a global plan, in my opinion. And I say that because how can an EU exist? How can the EU exist in a globalist sense, in a centralised globalist sense? Have a think on that. Even the EU itself must be subservient to a global authority and overlord. Otherwise, there will be no centralised world, um, new world, you know, thingy-me-jig. <sighs> Something which the WEF are openly pushing for, but I, you know, I, I digress. It would be nice to dream of a collapsed EU and EU member states regaining their national sovereignty. But I'm afraid that is pie in the sky. Everything is heading towards centralisation. And you have to be pretty dim to not see it. I mean, look how Brexit is unfolding. It's not unfolding the way that Brexiteers would have liked, people such as myself. No. Anyway, are you fooled by the media and the way they are framing world events like the protests in France? Let us know in the comments section below, and we will see you again tomorrow at 5.45. 5.45, 5.45. For your daily dose of Jeff. And I.